Hello, True Health Seekers, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Learn True Health podcast. We have with us an amazing guest. I just love Dr. Darren Schmidt. We're having him back on the show today. Dr. Darren Schmidt was first on the Learn True Health podcast in episode 253, where he shared the root cause of all disease. It's just a really fascinating, mind-bending episode. Gotta go back and listen to episode 253. He had so much information we, we, we just, we hardly scratch the surface and yet it, we dive so deep into the root cause of disease and, and, and the true way in which we can support the body's ability to heal itself. And yet we didn't get to talk a lot about diet. And so I said, okay, well, we got to have you come back on the show because he is an expert in helping people to adjust their diets so that food becomes their medicine. Food heals and nurtures the body and gives the body everything it needs to support its ability to heal itself. And so this episode today is all about how you can use food uh, or lack of food uh, through very specific fasting, um, which gets great results. I was blown away when he talked about how specific types of fasting can actually have the body to break down and remove pathogenic materials. I've even heard of people having tumors melt away because of this way, this lifestyle, this way of eating. So you'll definitely enjoy today's interview because it's going to arm you with all the information you need to use food as your biggest health tool. Another really big health tool for me has been the sunlight and sauna. I got mine back at the end of February. So I've been using it now for a few months and I have noticed Uh, such an increase in my stamina. I've been using it to detox heavy metals because I discovered that a lot of my symptoms were related to heavy metal toxicity. But we can also have other types of toxicity, uh, including environmental pollution and inflammation, um, sometimes even stress in and of itself is a toxin. And that was actually the last episode, episode uh, 268, we discussed uh, how stress can affect the body both mentally and physically. So if you are looking for a tool to help you detoxify yourself, uh, physically help you to actually sweat out and remove toxins in the most efficient way, if you're also looking for a way to decrease stress and help regulate healthy blood pressure, I highly recommend checking out the Sunlight and Sauna. Um, I have absolutely loved it. My husband's loved it and even my three-year-old has gotten in the sauna with us and has enjoyed it. Now, what I love about Sunlight is they also have a sauna for those who don't have room for a sauna. So I I got the one, it's like a TARDIS. It's like the size of um, a phone booth and uh, it's in the corner of our our spare bedroom. It doesn't take up a lot of room and it it fits actually, it's it's amazing. I call it a TARDIS because it, it, it sort of looks doesn't look that big and then we get in it and there's enough space for um, all three of us if you want to squish in there. Um, it's the only type of sauna on the market that is considered a medical device. It has um, the patents that um, allow them to be able to provide all spectrums of the infrared so far near and mid depending on what your needs are. Uh, the the near infrared decreases pain and the mid infrared uh, is really great for inflammation and they have programs so they have weight loss and anti-aging and relaxation and detoxification and cardiovascular so they have all kinds of programs that you can run uh, with your system but if you don't have room if you don't want the actual you know very traditional wooden sauna in your home maybe you have an apartment or a condo or, or you just don't have extra space for it they have a portable one and what's really impressed me and this is going to be the my next big purchase is going to be uh the sunlight and sauna called it's called the solo system and it allows you to lie down on it and i'm so impressed by it um i know dr mark hyman one of our past guests he has one i i know several other people that have it and they love it it is non-toxic and that's what's really impressed me about this uh this particular the sunlight and solo system is you can put it away in your closet it folds up you can travel with it so if you are let's say a massage therapist you can travel with it Um, or if you just have a small space you can easily take it out use it and put it back it has a dome that goes over your body and then you lay down on a mat 
and the mat heats up and so is the dome. So you have this very um, healing, like emotional healing from feeling like you're in the womb. You're feeling like you're being hugged uh, 360 degrees around your body in this warmth. It doesn't feel over hot. Um, Sunlight and just has, a, has an amazing way of, of, of fine tuning their infrared spectrum so that it's the most healing, so it gets the most detoxifying without making you just feel, feel too hot. Uh, so you can lay down, use the system, it's non-toxic, it's very low in EMF. And then you can, when you're done, you can get up, wipe it down and put it away. Uh, so it's, it's, it's easily stored. So there's really no excuse, there's no reason why you shouldn't have one if you're looking for decreasing pain, decreasing inflammation, getting rid of heavy metals, uh, getting, decreasing your stress levels, increasing your cardiovascular health. Those are all proven benefits of sauna. And um, I just love the sunlight and system. I was just talking today with their manager and she said she'd like to, they, the, that sunlight would like to extend a special to all of our listeners. The special promo that Sunlighten is offering the Learn True Health listeners is for the month of June, you'll receive $200 off of your Sunlighten system and shipping will only be $99. Normally shipping is $598, so that's basically giving you $499 off your shipping and $200 off any of their saunas. You can get the solo system, you can get the beautiful wooden box one that I have either either way depending on your needs now they also offer financing so you can do easy monthly payments they will ship it to you and you can easily pay it off while you're using it that was my biggest concern was uh, can I afford it so with easy financing yes I could afford it and it fits in my home and it gets results. I've lost over 15 pounds just in using the Sunlight and System. So I know that it decreased inflammation. I've definitely lost some inches. I've actually um, gone down two dress sizes uh, this year, which is fantastic because I just love how I feel using their system. And I also love hearing the results from other listeners who have purchased the Sunlighten system and have shared with me that their pain is decreasing, that their inflammation is going away, that they're noticing positive health results. So whatever health condition you're looking to alleviate, um, using this type of system is incredibly beneficial. Give them a call uh, or if you'd like, I can hook you up with uh, one of their wonderful people there. Just email me, ashley at learntrehealth.com and I will make an introduction for you. They have lots of science they can share with you, lots of articles and um, third-party uh, studies. They've got so much information backing up what they do. So if you're interested in any information about Sunlighten, please feel free to reach out to me or just Google them and give them a call. Make sure you mention the Learn Trail podcast so you get $200 off and the highly discounted shipping. Excellent. Well, enjoy today's show and please feel free to email me if you have any questions about any show or any information at all about health. I love hearing from the listeners and I love helping you guys. I love you. You are part of the Learn Trail community and we are sharing all this information so that we can help as many people to learn true health. Enjoy today's interview. Welcome to the Learn True Health Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley James. This is episode 269. Today we have with us an amazing doctor and we have him back on the show. Dr. Darren Schmidt was in episode 253 where he completely blew my mind. If you haven't listened to that episode, you got to go back. He connected the dots and helped us to understand the root cause of disease. Uh, and it, in that it has to do with the body's inability to remove lactic uh, acid or the buildup of it. And he discussed the different reasons why. Um, that was, it seems like a huge game changer. And yet scientists have known it for years. Um, I don't want to get too much into conspiracy theory, but it's like, if that is the root cause, 
of, of illness, you'd think that the pharmaceutical companies would be wanting to heal people by helping them figure it out. Instead, they want to manage us with drugs and not actually help us to heal the root cause of disease. <laughs> Do you ever think about that? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, uh, let's see, how do I want to put this? The, the way there's drugs, there is a drug to drop lactate in the blood or lactic acid. And you can also just take baking soda, but there's research on both. And the research shows that neither one actually heals the body. You can artificially lower, just like you artificially lower cholesterol or blood pressure. It doesn't mean that you're actually better. So it's, and you know, as the years went on from 1920 forward, they found other poisons, not just lactate, but other ones too, um, that just build up in the body causing dirty blood. And then the organs get sick. And the way you fix it is by repairing the organs. And how do you repair organs? Well, there's detox and there's, you know, eating organs and eating plants. So the solution really is natural. There's not a drug or medical therapy that can fix lactic acidosis. It's got to be done using the rules of mother nature. I love that you point that out, um, that even though we could artificially lower cholesterol and artificially lower blood pressure or even artificially regulate blood sugar, there's, there's still going to be um, health issues because we did not address the root cause. We did not n neutrify the body and help the body heal. Uh, we just tried to, it's sort of like if there's a fire um, we're throwing dr drugs at the, at the smoke, right? We're just trying to treat the smoke and the fire's still going on. And uh, so I love that you're here to help us understand the complexities of, of how we can use our diet to heal our body. Um, I know today we're going to talk about the ketogenic diet and when it's good to use it to heal the body and other diets. You're going to touch on other diets like the antifungal diet, the antiviral diet, that we can actually um, alter our diet as a means of medicine, as a means of healing the body. And uh, this is why I say I don't believe in one diet dogma. I think we should understand a variety of diets and use it as, as, as a way of healing ourselves. An athlete um, in training for a marathon would eat differently than an athlete who's not, who's not in training at all, who's, who's sort of just taking a break. You know, we, we, we understand that. And now we need to understand that we could actually shift our diet if um, we had diabetes or if we had weight to lose or if we had high blood pressure, or if we had an infection or if we had cancer and all these different uh, health issues, we could look to alter the diet and, and make significant uh, health changes just with what we're putting in our, our mouth throughout the day. I'm really excited for you to get into this. Um, I'd, I'd love for uh, the listeners just to know a tiny bit about you if they didn't get to listen to episode 253. So just so they understand how cool you are <laughs> as a doctor, <laughs> your website is the nhcaa.com. The, the link to, of course, everything that Dr. Darren Schmidt does is going to be in the show notes of today's podcast at learntrailhealth.com. And that stands for the Nutritional Healing Center of Ann Arbor. And you do have two other websites. Um, you d developed a really delicious, healthy uh, bar, and it's called uh, goodfat.bar. <laughs> so it's right. a .com. It's goodfat.bar. Uh, and then you also have another website where you educate doctors, and that is uh, powernutritionpractice.com. Of course, all those links are going to be in the show notes of today's podcast. Um, so just give us that little uh, bio of yours, uh, and then, and then we'll, we'll start talking about how we could utilize these healing diets. So my little bio is, um, I graduated from chiropractic school in 97 and in school I had uh, attended a number of nutrition seminars. So I decided to be a chiropractor who focuses on nutrition. So in 98, I started in on, uh, nutrition pretty heavily and, you know, now it's 20 years. And the idea is to see how much good we can do with just nutrition. And I keep learning more and more stuff. It's way more powerful than I think anybody even realizes. So that's what we're exploring. Love it. And you get incredible results um, with your patients and clients. And so those who are anywhere around the world, could they work with you through Skype? Yeah, we do phone calls and video um, consultations with people all over the world. Excellent. And now you also have an amazing resource, and that is your YouTube channel. 
Um, we're going to make sure that the link to your YouTube channel is in the show notes of the podcast as well, because uh, you just have a plethora of wonderful information. Getting into the ketogenic diet, uh, what what are the contraindications? Like when, because I think a lot of people jump into the ketogenic diet because it's kind of a fad right now, but we need to understand it's like it's like a medicine. Not everyone needs to take the same medicine. So when should people not do the ketogenic diet? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is if somebody has uh, candida, mold, yeast, that collection of organisms. And um, honestly, I've had only about six people who that, where they had candida or, or yeast, and they felt better doing ketosis. Everybody else, they felt worse because those organisms can live off of sugar and off of ketones. Oh. So, so I have them do a, a diet where... Um, as I call it low carb, but they're not in ketosis. So that's that's number one. And then number two, um, if somebody has cachexia, you know, they're losing weight, they're eating as many calories as they can. The ketogenic diet, I mean, that that's really tough because you lose weight anyways with the ketogenic diet. So I, I do have a few uh, cancer patients where they do like a five-day fast. And then between the fasting, they eat lots and lots of calories to gain their weight back. So that's another uh, sort of contraindication. You got to take it case by case. Got it. So so it's not meant for everyone. And if you have health complications, uh, you should work with a trained physician who understands a ketogenic diet and can help you navigate it. Right. Another possible contraindication would be if somebody has no gallbladder, um, then you have to give them ox bile or bile salts. And usually that does a trick, but not always. So liver gallbladder dysfunction can prevent that. But the ketogenic diet, you, and even if somebody's still trying to fast and they have a very dysfunctional liver or gallbladder, you know, they could be setting themselves up for trouble too. So you got to make sure the liver is clean and uh, gallbladder is working well. Now, beyond um, weight loss, what are uh, all the benefits, the major benefits of, of doing the ketogenic diet? Well, the ketogenic, okay, so let me just back up a little bit by saying that there's three ways to get into ketosis. So you got the ketogenic diet and then fasting, and then we can modify the fast by eating some oils and some low carb plants, <laughs> excuse me, and that would be called the fasting mimicking diet. So either way, the point is to get into ketosis and you also get into um, autophagy so the cells start to recycle themselves. But what are the benefits? Well, ke ketones have been shown to be toxic to cancer cells, meaning that they kill cancer cells. That's been shown in research. So I've had, uh, it's been seven people now with cancer and they reverse their cancer with Amazing. ketosis. And then of course the weight loss, but also primarily from hormonal control. So lowering insulin and and therefore lowering cortisol, raising testosterone for men, normalizing hormones for women, uh, better sleep, you know, melatonin and that kind of stuff. Um, so diabetes control, like re, there was a study, um, Sarah, Oh boy, I forgot her last name. But Dr. Finney and Dr. Volek were in on this study. It was published in uh, 2017, I believe. And 58% of the people in the experimental group reduced or got off their diabetes medications in 10 weeks. So total like reversal of type 2 diabetes. The other people just probably needed more time. So, I mean, basically, in my context, the biggest benefit is the it stops lactic acidosis. It it stops the body from making the waste products from carbohydrate metabolism. And those waste products are the things that create chronic disease, including weak ligaments and, you know, ADD and, all, you know, just, you know, disease after disease after disease. It all comes down to waste in the blood that starves the cells, that causes the cells to die, and then those organs start to malfunction. So how do you stop all that? Well the primary cause of chronic disease in the United States is just a high carbohydrate diet. So getting into ketosis stops that whole thing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Would okay. someone want to use it? Like do ketosis, like 
once a one time a year for like a month as sort of a, a cleanse to or would would someone want to do it on and off or is it really case by case uh well for maintenance um thomas Seyfried, he's a keto cancer researcher said everybody should do a one week fast per year just no food just water and salt and if that's not possible then at least get into ketosis four times a year like once you know per season for a few days so that's minimum and i have a book from paul bragg you know bragg's amino acids mm -hmm. and bragg's apple cider vinegar he did that he he did a one day fast a week and then four times a year he did like a five to ten day fast just for you know health maintenance and for those who never heard about the benefits like what physiologically what why would one want to incorporate regular fasting could you just um give us the overview yeah i mean in my mind the most important thing is you're just mimicking what our ancestors did everywhere around the world there were times when there was no food so the body would start to catabolize uh the fat you know you if you're carrying around extra weight just think of that as potential energy so your body taps into that and starts burning it so but it also burns away pathological tissue fibroids cysts the cancer cells um you know skin tags um pathological tissue goes away with uh, ketosis so your body cleans itself out and the body is smart it'll get rid of the path pathological tissue first before it starts going after your muscles which then if it does now you're in starvation so a thin guy like i'm six foot one i'm 170 i should be able to fast for 40 days which i probably will never do i'll just do a modified fast and ketosis but beyond 40 days that's when my body would be will be done with burning fat and start to go into burning muscle so um, i'm just clarifying the difference between uh, fasting ketosis and starvation so women who have um uh fibroids on their ovaries right would benefit uh because like mds yeah. will tell them they need a surgery and they'll always have them and that those fibroids aren't going away um, right. but you're saying that, that the body actually will catabolize, will basically right. di digest and remove the, 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 the scar tissue or the fibroids. Um, if we do enough, right. uh, fasting or, or some, some form of, uh, ketosis. Yeah. I have an employee. She's now a practitioner. She's been with me four years. I started talking about ketosis with my patients like about two years ago. And so she just jumped in on that. She's actually a former runway model. So back in that time, she would not eat for a long period of time, so she'd be slim on the runway. So once I started talking about ketosis, she immediately, you know, fasted, got in ketosis, and then and she was preparing to have another baby. Well, three months later, all the fibroids are gone because she had an exam at the hospital, and it only took three months. Oh, so then she had a gosh. baby, and everything everything is fine. Yeah, same thing with cysts. I mean, yeah, it's that's the miracle of uh, Mother Nature. <laughs> wow. And what about scar tissue, like in the joints? Would that also um, clear that up? The scar tissue in the joints? Um, I don't really know about that. I mean, I've had plenty of people where they have horrible knee pain, you know, and the doctor diagnosed them with osteoarthritis or whatever. And even even I like a year and a half ago, I last time I talked about the black mold poisoning that I had, and I decided I need to, you know, I, I started detoxing. I started running also. So a year and a half ago, I started running this three mile course right around my house, and my left knee hurt so bad, and I've run this course now, probably only I would only say like twelve to fifteen times in the last year and a half, but. I just ran it this morning again and no pain whatsoever. And I know it's from ketosis because that's what ketosis does. It saturates your body with fat. Your blood is filled with fat and not, and there's no sugar. So your cells have to now start burning the fat away and it cleans up your organs and it clean, you know, it gets rid of inflammation. Sugar is inflammation. Fat is lubricating. Fat is calming. 
So, you know, no knee pain whatsoever. And then this morning was my personal best on the three mile course. So, but that, you know, physiologically, that's what it comes down to is, is, you know, chronic disease is chronic inflammation, like research and MDs have been saying that for a couple of decades, but what's the inflammation? It's the, it's, it's not using fat, right? It's more than just, it's more than just burning too much sugar. It's the lack of burning fat. So you get your cells, you know, moving the fat around, recycling the old fat out, bringing the new stuff and everything gets lubricated and inflammation goes down. Your brain works mm -hmm. better. Your hormones are happier. Your endurance goes up like crazy. Muscles are stronger. I, you know, this is the way it used to be. You know, I, I just went through my grandmother's pictures. We have a farm in Ohio and I'm like capturing these, uh, these slides on my computer and they didn't have forklifts. They didn't have, <laughs> you know, they had, they had 50 pound bags of, of seed potatoes and they had to carry them, you know, like, and they had huge arms. <laughs> my, you know, my father and his, his father, these are big guys and they'd work all day. I spent 17 years working on the family farm as a kid, 17 summers. I never had breakfast and I would, you know, I basically did an 18 hour fast every day, every summer. And yeah, my stomach would growl, but that's part of health. You know, that's part of being, you know, in a human body is don't eat sometimes, you know, like <laughs> stop eating, you know, do some physical activity and let your body like work this kind of stuff out. Does that make sense? It absolutely does. Um, you just reminded me of, I know we talked a little bit about Dr. Joel Wallach um, before he wrote a book about uh, longevity and uh, he was looking at all the blue zones and kind of seeing, well, all these the areas in the world where people are like living to 100 way more easily without yeah. medical intervention. You're like these 100 year olds, there's like pictures of them. These 100, 100 year olds are still working on the farm or still, you know, still working out in their garden, like in Okinawa and in Georgia. Uh, and he sees that or he said that what's the commonality we have um obviously they're eating food that's rich with nutrients um but they're with what the difference between their diet and our diet is that they're eating like 800 calories a day but that 800 calories has is so dense in nutrition and so he equated um longevity to eating low calories and i've heard that from right. other studies like he said that you know years ago right. and now we're seeing it more and more that um lower calories uh like you don't want to have necessarily a fast metabolism you know when you think you think oh fast metabolism is good because then you're burning really fast and you're kind of burning yeah. really hot but it's like you want you want l low you want to consume less calories and uh and kind of get optimized get your body so optimal but also make sure those calories are, are super dense in nutrition right. um and they're finding that that is what the people who live the longest do. Um, so that's sort of part of this idea of, of, of intermittent fasting or choosing to fast a few times a year uh, because that brings on the natural ketosis. Or if someone can't fast, then they can do the ketogenic diet, which is a diet that mimics fasting. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah, and so getting back to the low calories, I mean, the more healthy fat you eat, the less calories you end up eating. So that's been proven in research before too. And like, and I've been, you know, I study nutrition every day. And what is the one food that is probably densest in nutrients in any other food? It's probably liver. So the, and then the plant, you know, the dense nutrients come from liver and other organ meats. And then like homegrown organic gardens. So it's a combination of plants and animals, you know, to help people get the densest nutrition with the least amount of calories. The other thing about the blue zones and, you know, long lived uh, cultures is I think it's part of their culture. They just want to live long, mm. you know, they get older and they, they like it and mm -hmm. they do things to keep living longer. They just have the attitude and that probably might be the biggest factor in living long. Oh, I so agree with you. Yeah. That you you know that that the desire to want to get up every day and go move around. Um, I remember a long time ago back in college when I was studying pathology, we looked at um, you know let's say a woman is depressed and she's in her 
sixties, she'll kind of hunch her shoulders a bit. Well, you hunch your shoulders for 10 years and all of a sudden you start to develop that dowager's hump. You know, the, you see a kind of a, I mean, a man can have it too, but it's the, it's where the, the, you kind of look like a turtle walking around. You got a big, big, you know, hunchback of Notre Dame look. And, and that causes a, so let's say someone's really depressed. They're not, they're not getting out there. They're not really wanting to be active. Maybe they're sitting around watching TV all day. Um, they don't really have a thirst or a drive for life. Their physiology will, will morph over time. And then their, their posture hardens and to the point where they can't sit up straight. And that, and even if you just have a little bit of that hump that, that compresses on the lungs, meaning that the body can't bring in, take a deeper breath. And, they, right. and if they hit, if they have the next influenza that comes around, they might actually die of pneumonia because if they can't take a, a full breath in and out, then then the the liquid collects in the lungs, and it's a self fulfilling prophecy of though you know if you if you're not out there loving life and stretching and moving your body and you know working in your garden or playing with your grandkids, um, and not keeping your posture and not keeping yourself limber, um then you know you're you're basically cre- slowly creating death right and i just thought that was interesting that seeing how attitude could could be the spark of what would end that person's life maybe 10 years down or 15 years down the road um yeah what so i, I did the ketogenic diet and and i uh, i think i i started off working with a naturopath and i and i worked with her for like 3 months and i was you know really on on par and then um, I kind of went off on my own and, and did it for like another two years on and off. And then I got blood work done and it was scary. Like I had liver uh, damage and um, kidney issues. And so I had to stop. And I thought mm. this is this is kind of dangerous to just just do willy nilly without checking in with the doctor, without, you know, really making sure that the the, the diet is the correct ratios and so, um, can you speak to a, a bit about that, uh, how, how we can make sure that we're eating this diet correctly and not harming the body? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So let's talk a little bit of history. Um, so there were fasting clinics across the United States that the federal government shut down between 1912 and 1920. And the fasting clinics uh, were really successful, obviously, with epilepsy because ketosis is great for that. So doctors are like, well, how are we going to treat our kids with epilepsy? So they created the ketogenic diet. And now they didn't call it that at the time. They called it the diet that mimics fasting. And they did great research back then. And one guy was named Dr. Wilder, and he had a ratio. Another guy named Dr. Woodyot, who's he had a ratio too. Um, but it's a bit more complicated. Anyways, we, I work with Dr. Wilder's ratio, and here's what it is. So you're looking at grams, not percentages of calories. It's just pure grams. It's a two-to-one ratio of fat versus protein plus carbs. So I have people use a app on their phone called Chronometer to track their macronutrients. And there's other apps besides Chronometer, but... I've seen them be wrong. Chronometer was actually designed with the idea in mind that people will eat a high fat diet. And the math is correct on chronometer. It's spelled, I'm going to spell it C-R-O-N-O-M-E-T-E-R. So now the average American diet is a one to four ratio of fat versus protein plus carbs. Now, when you go to two to one, you're going to be in what's called heavy nutritional ketosis. So um, let's talk about these ratios a little bit. So now protein and carbs sort of burn the same way in the body. They act clinically, they act the same way. Okay, now obviously physiologically, they don't burn the same way as fuel, but they show up in the blood together as sugar. Okay, now fat, eating fat, does, it does not burn like sugar at all, basically. So that's why you put the protein plus carbs together and you compare that with the fat grams. Okay, you with me on that? Mm -hmm. Okay, now I think when Atkins was popular, he didn't know that. And he was having, he just said do low carb 
And then some people did low carb and high fat, other people did low carb and high protein. And not everybody got good results. I think it's because people are eating too much protein. Mm -hmm. And so with Dr. Wilder's ratio, it's really safe and I have success after success after success. So now if you increase your fat and you lower your protein and carbs to a three to one ratio, you'll just go deeper into ketosis. And then you can do a four to one ratio. And I have cancer patients do that. But if you're overweight and otherwise relatively healthy, a two to one ratio will work out really well. Um, Would increasing that ratio make them lose weight faster or is that not healthy? Yeah, it's fine. It'll help you lose weight faster. And just like any time when you go into ketosis, whether it's from fasting or changing your diet, you want to make sure that you get um, salt because the initial weight loss is water and your body will urinate out the potassium or, you know, other minerals. So make sure you're consuming like, you know, one to two teaspoons of salt per day during that time. Okay. Is there so, a particular kind of salt that you prefer? Is any salt fine? Yeah. I mean, the Himalayan rock salt or the Celtic sea salt. Those are the ones I prefer. Yeah. And they can just add it to their food. This doesn't have to be like a supplement. Right. They can just add it to their water if they're fasting or they can add it to their food, mm -hmm. you know, if they're eating food. Yeah. So, so that's the basics of getting into ketosis. And with new patients, they start off with chronometer and they're ch checking their grams. And even if they hit two to one in the first couple of three weeks, they're not yet in ketosis. So you're measuring ketosis in your food using chronometer, and then you got to measure it in your blood. And, and you could do urine, but for my patients, and we, when you're serious about it, you, you're measuring it in your blood, and I recommend Keto Mojo, which is a device you can buy online. On their website, you can buy it from us. Either way, keto-mojo.com. Why do you recommend the Keto Mojo? I've, I, it's been advertised to me a lot on Facebook. Well, there was one called Precision Extra that I recommended. And um, the blood sugars on that was just a little off, mm. whereas Keto Mojo is more accurate and it's cheaper too. And I, you know, I hope the Precision Extra guys fix their product. And then we can have more, you know, free market competition on that. But that's why I recommend Keto Mojo. It's funny their name is Precision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a concern that the ketogenic diet is um acidic for the body and it, it kind of puts a, a further stress on the body and using up its mineral resources to kind of buffer out the the acidity how do you combat that yeah eat, take in more minerals and uh, then come out of ketosis and then you know eating lots of plants anyways with the ketogenic diet the most nutrient dense green leaves that you can find so you get your minerals that way so let, you want to talk about coming out of ketosis? Sure. Okay. So if, let's say you're doing a two to one ratio to come to go into it. And you achieve that after like three, four weeks. Now it's time to come out. So you do a, at the most, you do a one to two ratio. So you just reverse it. One gram of fat to two grams of protein plus carbs. So, you know, your listeners may have to listen to this a few times and take notes. Okay. It's totally fine. I've, that's yeah. actually the feedback I've gotten from listeners of this show. I listened to that episode three times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So a one to two ratio, in my opinion, is the maximum that you want to go into sugar burning. Okay. Now I have some people where they're just on the cusp of burning sugar and burning fat. They're right, right at that borderline. That's like a one to one ratio of fat versus protein plus carbs. Okay. Now I hang out at one to 1.5. That's my, that's my low carb ratio when I'm not in ketosis. A lot, I have a lot of patients doing that. And it is that precise. And you know, you may think, well, why be that specific? Well, you know, you're building a body, you're rebuilding a sick body, mm. right? It's like, if you, if you ask somebody to build a house and you say, well, how do you build a house? And they say, well, I, I dig a hole and I put down some concrete and some wood. It's like, no, 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 you, you want measurements. You want feet, 
you know, you want depth, you want height, you want measurements, you want numbers. So, you know, if it's, if you're serious about it and you really need to return, return back to health, you know, you got to work with numbers. Okay. Do you have a, cause some people are like, well, okay, that's great. But like, what do I eat? Do you have just like a, a guide or a menu or here's an example plan for sticking with the one to two ratio? I do. Yeah. Um, and I have it as a YouTube video. So the name of the video is called these are the ketogenic foods. Great. Can you give us some, um, a, a deep, a little bit of an understanding as to what ketogenic foods are? Cause like, I remember last time you said eggs are not ketogenic because <laughs> some people think, okay, well, I'm right, just going to yeah. eat my, I'm going to eat my coconut oil and my eggs and I'll be fine. And <laughs> eggs are not ketogenic. So could, what is ketogenic? I think people think it's just like bacon and coconut oil and, and that doesn't seem healthy. Well, it's, Okay, so I went through a whole bunch of foods and I looked at, I used chronometer and I looked at the ratio and if the food was two to one or three to one or four to one on the ratio, then it's ketogenic. Now, okay, so most meat is not ketogenic, but if you add butter to it or if you add, you know, extra oil, then it becomes, the, then the meal is ketogenic and you can have like a not very ketogenic breakfast, but then you have a very ketogenic lunch and dinner and overall your day was you know ketogenic so it's a time frame now if you have now the one meat that i found to be ketogenic is pork bacon so if you you know have pork bacon wrapped with bacon dipped in butter it is <laughs> it is healthy it is healthy right as long as you can do it with your liver and your gallbladder and it'll get you into ketosis cuz ketosis is healthy and then you come out of it right then you you know, you're cycling in and out. So here's the bigger picture. The bigger picture is not necessarily just to achieve ketosis. The The bigger picture is to achieve it and then go into sugar burning and then fat burning and sugar and fat. That's called keto adaptation. So my veteran patients, including myself, for example, are able to get into ketosis in a day mm -hmm. just by changing, right, right, by not eating or by changing their diet. So that means your mitochondria there's like 3,000 per cell for a trillion cells. <clears throat> Your mitochondria are very easily <clears throat> adapting to your diet and to your physical needs. Whereas a sick body is not able, the sick cells, the sick mitochondria, they're not able to adapt like that. So keto adaptation is the ultimate goal. So that's why, you know, Paul Bragg, you know, talks about doing a one day fast per week. You know, and then the keto, Dr. Mercola, he was in, he was in ketosis for a long time and he felt sick. And then he was mentored by somebody who said, you got to come out. So he did. And then he felt great. So you go in and out, in and out. Cause you so can I'm be out, of, you can be in ketosis for too long, just like you can be in sugar burning for too long. You know, then you end up with diabetes and cancer and heart disease. Cause you've been burning sugar your whole life. The point right. isn't to stick to this diet for the rest of your life. The point isn't to be keto. keto. Like some people are like 100% always keto. And I was for like, you know, the good better part of two years. And that wasn't healthy either. Like I, I you know, I that that was my experience. And so I've been like poo-pooing the ketogenic diet thinking, well, this destroyed my body. And that it was I was doing it wrong. I mean, I was always always open to the fact that I was doing it wrong. So we're not supposed to always be in it because it's a diet that mimics fasting, and we're not really supposed to fast, you know, <laughs> for a hundred days straight. <laughs> right. Right. So we're supposed to use it as a medicine, use the ketogenic diet very um, in a very structured way, like we would fast in a structured way. So if you're like, you're not going to be like, well, I'm just just going to stop eating today, and maybe. Maybe I'll eat next year, right? So we're gonna be like, no, right. I'm gonna eat on. I'm gonna stop eating today. I'm gonna eat on Friday, and I'm gonna right. like. I'm gonna have a specific plan for getting into my fast. I'm gonna have a specific plan for getting out of my fast because you can't just like go through the drive-through McDonald's like after a five day. You can't just break your fast with whatever, right? You have to break it in a with more gentle, easy, easy to digest foods. Um, right. And so we want to have this. We want to have the same kind of mentality around the ketogenic diet that it's not. It shouldn't, it almost shouldn't be called a diet because you think you could be right. on that way of eating. It should be like the method, the ketogenic like right. fasting method. Lifestyle. I call it the ketogenic lifestyle. 
so it's it, but it, it it in of itself should um include coming out so going right. in and coming out that ebb and flow um how often should someone i mean obviously there's there's people who want to prevent illness so there's just like kind of a maintenance plan but people who actually have illness like diabetes cancer heart disease okay. or you know high blood pressure or or you know obesity um or epilepsy or ms Right. I know that that this is also very healing or hormone issues. Like you said, this is very healing for people who want to clean up the pathological tissue, balance right. hormones, um, decrease inflammation. So, so for those people who actually have something to heal, what, right. how often should they go in? How often should they come out? How long should they stay out? How long should they stay in? Yeah. So a severe um, health case, like, let's say somebody's got placking in their arteries and they need to work on this uh, very diligently, I would say be in ketosis nine days out of 10. So basically three days a month, they're burning sugar. Okay. And the other days they're burning fat. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and that'd be true for people with uh, neurological issues and diabetes. And, and then now I do have some people though, they do a mild ketosis 24 hours a day every day for a long time because when they've gotten out of ketosis they didn't feel very good this is true for about two people i think in the last two years maybe three at the most okay but everybody's different right mm -hmm. so if somebody is uh, relatively healthy but they have concerns about being pre-diabetic or fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue depression um, they should do like five days of ketosis let's say during the work, uh, the work week, and then two days out of ketosis on the weekends. And then, so that's more moderate. And then if somebody is healthy and they want to maintain their health, uh, let's say they do a, a five days of ketosis per month. And then the rest of the month they're eating low carb, like that one to 1.5 ratio. So, and then they, of course they're tracking their weight and they're checking their brain power and their endurance. And they may decide to be in ketosis more often. Now, if somebody is not very interested in their health and they just want to do the bare minimum, that's where they would do ketosis four times a year. Okay. So that's the least. I feel like if anybody knows me, they should at least be in ketosis four times a year just because you know me. <laughs> <laughs> I know Schmidt, so I got to get in ketosis this fall, you know, or it's winter time. <laughs> Can you, um, I, I think we addressed this a little bit in the last episode, but um, there's sort of this, I mean, this is the problem with, with, with health information is that there's always going to be something totally contradictory that also works. And you right. have like um, this incredibly low fat diet um, that, uh, that also clears out arteries and that it's just, it's basically like a hundred percent vegetables and whole grains, no meat, no fat at all. Um, not even cooking with oil. And, uh, you're just eating like 12 cups of leafy greens, you know, every day with, with maybe, you know, some brown rice or something like that. And, um, and that diet is clearing out arteries. Um, you know, how come that can this and, and th those doctors that use that say that oil is bad, that it harms the arteries, that it's, you know, doing a bunch of damage, like even coconut oil. Um, and then you have this totally opposite diet over here. I mean, not that opposite because, you know, the ketogenic diet, you know, you want to consume a lot of leafy green vegetables because um, it's it's, you know, it's it's a vehicle for the fat. Right. <laughs> you can. Right. It's a great, healthy vehicle for the fat. But you have a diet in terms of ratio. You know, that, you know, this one diet is like a, lots of fat, very little carbs, you know, and then you've got this other diet, which is no, almost no fat, just the fat from, from vegetables and lots of, you know, carbs, but you know, carbs from vegetables and both of them work to clean up right. the heart. So what's up right. with that? <laughs> That's a great question. And I, I think that in my career that I, f I figured this out and in my brain, this is the greatest discovery that I've had in my career. So here it is. Um, 
<clears throat> so they both address lactic acidosis. And the vegan diet, I'm going to call it a vegan diet. Sure. Um, cleans the body, right? It cleans the blood. And we're, and so does, so does ketosis, where you, the body stops making the lactate and the acetaldehyde and these other chemicals from carbohydrate metabolism. So now I've done a series of, of vid videos on veganism versus ketosis, which is sort of like a discussion that nobody really has. The discussion is always, you know, low fat uh, versus low carb or other sort of other debates and other discussions. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. Uh, now there's this organization in England called the Public Health Collaboration. And I just found them a couple weeks ago, but they've been uh, tracking the randomized controlled trials, you know, the, the best type of, uh, you know, studies on healthcare, these randomized control trials and which ones are in favor of low fat versus low carb when it comes to health parameters. <clears throat> and the, th the score is 31, zero low carb wins over low fat. So wow. yeah. And, and they, they really looked at. 62 studies or they've been looking at lots and lots of studies but there's 31 other studies that it's a draw between low carb and low fat but there's no studies when you compare the two that say that low fat is better mm -hmm. so so really when you compare those two parameters <clears throat> now i just think i honestly think that veganism is just like ketosis you do it for a short period of time to clean right? the body. Like our ancestors would walk. Yeah. And to burn sugar. Because then, you know, when you're coming out of a fast or you're coming out of ketosis, burning sugar becomes very therapeutic. Just like going into ketosis, burning fat becomes very therapeutic. So cycle. It's like we, yeah, cycle. So our ancestors would walk around and they'd see, a, you know, berries. There'd be an acre of berries and they'd eat that for, you know, five days. Mm -hmm. And they'd get all like you know, relaxed and maybe a little bloated and their brains would slow down. They'd sleep underneath the trees and be all chill. And then they would, you know, be tired of that, you know, and maybe not eat for a day or two. And then they'd go hunting deer and they'd eat deer for a week, you know? So that's what our ancestors used to do. I think that's what, you know, as, so I think that's true for veganism. It's a temporary thing. And just to clarify, it's not that our ancestors went around eating coconut oil and intentionally getting into ketosis. I mean, the only culture I can think that would have done that was would be like the Inuit who would render the fat from a seal. And, you know, but other than that, it wasn't like that much fat was existing in nature. It was that they were fasting when they went between gorging on berries and finding the next meal, which might have taken a few days. So a few days every week, um, they were fasting, which is ketosis. And so just eating this diet that doesn't have any, as very little carbs and lower protein and high fat, um, causes the body to do the exact same thing it would do if we were fasting. Right. Well, I did a video on that too. It was ketogenic foods our ancestors used to eat. Oh. That's the name of that video. So when you look at um, historical records of people who studied the, the tribes, for example, Native Americans would hunt for the fattiest buffalo and they would kill a buffalo and they would break the forearm and open up the bone. And if the bone marrow uh, slipped out like water, they, would, would not, they wouldn't even touch the whole, whole carcass. It wasn't fatty enough the bone marrow would have to stay solid inside the bone. And if that happened, then they would eat that. They eat the marrow, the brain, the spinal cord. And then of course, let's not forget the fatty hump that's on the back of the buffalo and the deer and the elk and the moose. That fat, that's brown fat, that's very metabolically active, filled with hormones. It keeps their whole body warm. So then they would make pemmican from that, which is basically just all fat. Sometimes they throw in some berries for flavoring or preserve it, like the you know the antioxidant properties of vitamin C in the berries. But the Native Americans would carry pemmican with them for days as they go hunting, and they live not they'd eat nothing but that. And and so, but I have um, patients from tropical India 
And one girl I was talking to, she said that there's fruit available all the time, all year round. But in her religion, at least where she grew up, she's Hindu, they would not eat for a day a week. So yeah, there's the there's the fasting part. Cool. But you know, but yeah, in that video I talk about um other types of food like the beaver tail. Like the beaver tail is like all fat. You know, so that's what they that's what they went after. Thinking about haggis, what is this like all organs, oh, yeah. right? Is would haggis be a ketogenic oh, yeah. food? Yeah. And awful, you know, O F F A L. Oh, I thought you were saying that, that haggis was awful. Well, it probably is. <laughs> but but awful is a term which is basically haggis. It's the stuff inside the guts. And it, it can, it's comprised of uh, ligaments and muscle and fat. So the term awful actually means the stuff that falls off the butcher's block. You know, they're discarding it, right? They're trying mm-hmm. to cut a specific nice, you know, type of, you know, meat. And But anyways, yeah, awful. That's good stuff. It's fatty. <laughs> and what about uh, if someone's not into eating meat? Um... I I know that people can be vegan and and keto. Right. Uh, Are there any plant-based foods that are ketogenic? Like, um, I guess, nuts and seeds. Would avocado be ketogenic? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, plant-based ketogenic foods. Um, And then the fruit oils. That's a specific term. That's the avocado oil, the um, olive oil, and the coconut oil, fruit oils. And then avocados are just fantastic. They're a three to one ratio. And then walnuts are, you know, three to one. Coconut meal is like five to one. I I don't remember specifically, but there's very, very ketogenic plants. And it's not, you know, necessarily the stem or the leaves or definitely not the fruit, you know, from, you know, when you think of fruit like apples and stuff, it's the fatty part of the plant that, you know, and then in the tropics with the coconut and then cacao nut, you know, the, my good fat bar is cacao butter and Ooh. it's a you know you know they turn that into chocolate mm-hmm. so yeah these these tropical plants are they have lots of fat in them so coconut you know coconuts are super you know ketogenic got it so someone could take um avocado and some nice leafy green vegetables and um some coconut oil and make themselves a gorgeous salad or wrap uh, and that would right. be a great ketogenic meal can you give us some examples of your favorite ketogenic meals, just to kind of paint the picture of what it looks like to eat and go into ketosis? Uh, yeah. So salad, I put the olive oil on it. Um, I actually like avocado oil more now because it's more mild. Um, and then so my salad has <clears throat> the sulfury type plants on it, like I love radishes. And then I put cheese on it. And there's, you know, there's cheese that's not keto. So, you, and there's olives that are not keto. You just make sure you read the label. Um, so then what else? Um, I eat a lot of olives. And um, when I eat, well, let's see, you're, are you trying to stay, you're trying to stay away from the meat, right? Well, no, I, I think just give people a variety because I know that there are listeners who are plant-based and listeners who are not. Yeah. So just to give sort yeah. of different examples. Right, so snacks and even meals would include lots of uh, walnuts. I use chia seeds all the time with my salads. Chia seeds are a six to one ratio of fat versus protein wow. plus carbs. Yeah, you never would have thought a chia pet would be a good ketogenic food, right? <laughs> you know, um, I make the most delicious like chia pudding, <laughs> and it's uh, like a can. I don't know how you feel about the canned coconut, like it's organic. Oh, I'm a huge fan. Full fat canned coconut, you know, cream, basically. And then, and then just, you know, take that, take a bunch of chia seeds. Uh, I've sort of figured out like how many, I think it's like maybe one and a half tablespoons per can. Uh, But I I make my chia pudding really thick. And then I'll add some frozen blueberries to that. um, And put a little, sometimes I'll put stevia, sometimes it won't, because my husband doesn't like stevia and I do. So we kind of, you know, compromise there and uh, throw that in, like mix it really well, throw it in the fridge. And then I'll like, I'll make that in at night. And then in the morning we'll just, we'll share it. And um, we all love it. And it's so like rich in omegas. Oh yeah. It's so good. And you can eat a lot of it, right? It's so good. It's delicious. Well, it's very filling because it's, you know, high in fiber. 
um and it's you know it's incredibly high in fat like the whole the whole thing is like a bowl of fat basically right. but plant-based fat and so uh, in terms of a keto breakfast that that'll really get you going i think i've also yeah. tried making it with like adding a little bit of mct oil once adding a little bit of coconut oil. like i just played around with it yeah. um but you really don't need to add any more because like you said it's a uh, six to one ratio the chia seeds yeah and the coconut uh cream in the can i believe it's five to one and the coconut milk in a can is four to one. So it's very ketogenic. And I did a video on it too. I call it ice cream. Uh, uh, I think I call it ice cream all day. Nice. Equals, equals ketosis. Yeah. <laughs> ice cream I put coconut <laughs> or I put um, regular plain old. It's probably horrible, but uh, Hershey's uh, chocolate powder, you know, the, the cocoa I, powder. I totally I know what you're talking in. about because normally I buy the organic cacao powder, but we yeah. ran out and my husband and I were like, hankering for my keto pudding i put it up on my website so we'll link it in the show notes but i have i we sort of perfected over many months of making this we so my my son um he doesn't need any added sugar he's never had ice cream in his life and so we um like no no dairy ice cream or anything like that so we made uh a keto you know pudding and we call it ice cream so when he says i want some ice cream it's like that's what we give him and it's um it, so we use the cacao powder and a little bit of stevia and we use the um gelatin um it's all in that recipe there on the website but uh one night we were like just really hungry for it and we ran out of our organic you know gorgeous cacao powder so we ran to the yeah. gross regular grocery store and we bought the hershey's powder <laughs> yeah so i know exactly what you're talking about and um, it was good I, I, yeah. I you know the hershey's powder was good so you you uh you were saying you added the hershey's powder to right so the coconut milk or cream and then i use stevia there's another sweetener on the market called monk fruit so this is from the orient and it's like the fruit of the gods so cacao uh, the cacao nut, you know, for cacao butter, that's food of the gods of, you know, Latin and Central America. And then that's, so that's the good fat bar. Then we have three new ones that are keto, three new good fat bars. So it's food, food of the gods plus fruit of the gods. Anyways, you can try out the monk fruit too. And some people do sort of pick up on that stevia like aftertaste with a monk fruit. I don't, but uh, yeah, it seems to be a big hit. The thing about the aftertaste is, you sort of get used to it and then it doesn't bother you. Like you just try it for a week. I was really big into adding sh like tons of sugar to my coffee. This was, you know, over 10 years ago. Cause when I met my husband 10 years ago and he convinced me to do no coffee, no sugar in my coffee. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like I was the kind of person where there had to be like syrup of at the bottom of the mug when I was done drinking. Cause there was that that didn't get to dissolve. That was how much sugar I used to put in my coffee. Yeah. And I mean, what I didn't know is I was I was using co copious amounts of coffee and sugar to to mask my symptoms of adrenal fatigue because I had really bad oh, yeah. adrenal fatigue. And so he convinced me to stop adding sugar to my coffee, not not for health reasons. It's because he's from Seattle and that's not you. Know, you don't mess <laughs> with coffee. <laughs> he's like, yeah. you can add cream to it, but you can't add sugar to it because you can't mess with the pure the purity of coffee. It was sort of like. um you know, against his, you know, r coffee religion. And, uh, and so I, I stopped and I, and he said, listen, you're, you're going to love it. And I said, are you kidding me? I love sugar. Well, sure enough, three, three or four days of, of, of drinking coffee with no sugar. And I started to taste the coffee and he's like, see, and, um, yeah, it was amazing. And now, now I put stevia, uh, in, in drinks or, or in, you know, desserts, very little stevia, Whereas before I'd have to have put tons of sugar in. So I noticed my palate change and also my palate changed with after you start using stevia, that weird flavor will, will go away. It's like your, yeah. your brain just, just starts perceiving it as sweet and stops perceiving the other flavor that came along with it. Right. So it's, it's, yeah. it's about adapting, you know, at the, when we start eating a new way, like, like if you've never eaten the ketogenic way and all of a sudden now you're eating all this fat, it just, it's different, you know, everything tastes different. Right. And, uh, and there's sort of that transition period. Plus, um, some people need the extra gallbladder support. I know I cannot do the ketogenic diet without taking the ox bile, um, 
so for those who have never done keto and they're like, okay, you've definitely piqued their interest. They want to, they want to start, you know, eating this way and going in and out yeah. to support their body and cleaning up pathological tissue and gaining all the benefits of, of, of eating this way. Um, what sort of things should they expect? Like if they've never experienced it, you know, the keto flu, maybe diarrhea because they ate, they are not used to eating so much fat. The body hasn't kind of produced enough bile. Um, how do they combat that? How do they combat the keto flu? Uh, what should they expect in the first, the first round of getting into ketosis? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think the most common concern is, uh, sugar cravings. So let me address that first. So now I taught, I've been teaching low carb my whole career and teaching keto now for like two years. And the first step in low carb is reduce the carbs, but I've changed that. So the first step for this whole process is increase the healthy fats. And in a few days, you're going to end up eating less food. Then it's easy to go low carb. Does that make sense? Got it. Yeah, that, make, that's that a, makes sense. So instead of going a, low carb first, because now you're you have no you're not getting energy from anything. So right, you're saying yeah. increase the healthy fats. So now you've got uh it's yes, it's more calories temporarily, but it's also you've got more fuel in the tank, and then you drop the carbs, and so now right. the body can easily because it's sort of like switching the body can go from d diesel to gasoline. And right. if you've been burning gasoline this whole time, it's not, don't drain the gasoline tank before you fill up the diesel tank, fill up the diesel tank first and then drain the gasoline tank. Right. Yeah. That makes so sense. that was a, that was a huge, uh, huge benefit for, uh, helping my patients with that. Okay. Now keto flu. Um, so I, I've come to understand that it's primarily detoxification. So just imagine the fat cells have been sitting there, uh, storing this energy not ever being tapped into for a long time. Now the body's starting to burn this fat and pull it out and use it. So toxins are in the fat cells. So now out come the toxins and now your liver's got to take care of it and your kidneys and your lymphatic system might get overwhelmed. So that's where a detoxification type supplements or a detox program would work. Um, and and I, I have a video on how I think that ketosis is the foundation of detoxification. Now, if you're not into taking supplements and you just want to push through, you can push through. So you go into ketosis, you feel bad, you feel tired, and you come out, give your body a break, do it again, you know, and as you do it over and over again, you get more and more benefit, less and less keto flu, you know, you get more and more detox happening. So you, your body's actually getting cleaned out that way. So that's the deal with keto flu. It's just toxicity coming out. Got it. And so it's temporary. It'll go away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Drink more water. Yeah. It's like, I, I consider it like training a puppy. The puppy doesn't want to do what you're telling it to do. You kind of have to drag it <laughs> across the, the training floor at puppy school. So your body's the same thing and it'll give you resistance, but then give it a break, you know, like, you know, get out of ketosis and just be prepared. It might happen again. Hopefully next time it's not going to be so bad. So, and so when I started getting into ketosis, I had uh, black mold poisoning sitting in my heart and man, my heart hurt so bad. Wow. So I only, so I only got into ketosis like once a month for the first six months, just for a day. In the meantime, I was taking these fantastic supplements and then six months later, got in ketosis, no heart pain whatsoever, started feeling all these other benefits that were sort of masked by the horrible black mold. And so now I get into ketosis one or two days a month. That's it. It helps me run my 5K path. It helps me work out with weights. And um, so there's that. Now, let me switch over to, to diarrhea. So I had mentioned <clears throat> if you have trouble with your liver, gallbladder, then the ox bile and bile salts could come into play. You can get that stuff on Amazon. Oftentimes, it, those two things come together as one pill. Some people may need... I just did a video on this. So some people may need ox bile only. Other people may need bile salt only. One thing I see all the time is that MCT oil, which is a oil derived from coconut oil, it stands for medium chain triglycerides. 
And I guess it's a, a type of oil that gets people in ketosis very, very easily. But I've seen so many people get diarrhea from that. I used to sell it out of my office, but I quit selling it just because I had, I got tired of people complaining about it. <laughs> so they can they can complain to the health food store and not to me. <laughs> so there's there's that. I just think that you know it's totally fine to do the fruit oils to increase the fats very easily. Yeah. Is there? I mean, is oh, does the MCT oil have any health benefits over olive oil? I mean, is there really like a medicinal difference? Oh, this is a. That's a great question. Um, uh, not necessarily like MCT oil. It's, it's not any kind of super great thing, I don't think, just because so many people get diarrhea from it. But, but let me tell you this. I just had a woman. Um, she's been with me for about two months now. She's been going in and out of ketosis, getting great results. Uh, energy's up. She's losing weight. Uh, two weeks ago, I talked to her about using avocado oil instead of coconut oil. She's actually from the Bahamas. So she was doing doing that. And I said, well, I've been doing avocado oil. And I really like it. And I just that's kind of like all that I said to her about it. So she started using it. And in one week she was down 10 pounds. And her energy was her energy was through the roof. So she's got a full time job and she's going to school to get her masters. And she'd come home from work, even in ketosis, you know, she's tired at the end of the day. She's sleeping well, um, but with the avocado oil ketosis, she's coming home from work and she's cleaning her house, <laughs> and she lost ten pounds in seven days. Right? This it's there's a difference with these types of oils for different people, mm. right? So bacon grease might be better for somebody versus lard versus avocado oil versus olive oil. You know, n equals one, right? And and meaning like how many people are being tested here? One is you, you know, you're different from everybody else. And it comes down to like what works best for your body. So that was, that was a, a really big discovery when she told me that like, there is a difference between olive oil, keto and avocado oil, keto versus other types of fats. What, how would one test that? So let's put on our lab coat and be a, be a personal scientist um, they're getting into ketosis and they're like one week, they're going to do olive oil. The next week they're going to do avocado oil or whatever. Um, what would you look for to know that that oil is resonating better, that their body is using that more efficiently as fuel? Is it energy, weight loss, sleep, no hunger, um, more ketones when they test it? Like, yeah, it's, can... it's all that. Mm -hmm. Everything you just said is exactly and then you write it down uh, every day for a week, and then you come out of ketosis for a couple of days, and then go back in using a different oil to track that. Which brings up, can, can let me just kind of like move on from there a little bit. I had a guy do a 10-day fast, and um, his ketones, he was testing in his blood, his ketones were going up, you know, to like seven, which is really high. He was deep in ketosis by the third day, fourth day, fifth day. And here's he did something very interesting. He stopped drinking water for 48 hours. That's called a dry fast. Have you heard of that? I have not. I mean, I I know that religions do it, uh, but I have not actually heard of uh, doing a dry fast for health. Yeah, so this is advanced. And um, I can only say this because he's my patient and he told me his experience. And there's going to be other people online. They have different experiences with a dry fast. So for 48 hours, and the reason why it was 48 hours is because at one point it was midnight and he's like, oh my gosh, I guess I'm really thirsty. So he drank a whole bunch of water. And now during the dry fast, his ketones were so high that his uh, keto mojo said HI, right? It wasn't even a number. It was like off that chart. And, um, so then he drank a bunch of water at midnight, went to bed, woke up, and his ketones were 5.6. Water brought him, brought down his ketones. Just water alone. Why is so that, that? It just, um, was it dilution? Well, what he said was in his research, uh, people are saying that when your body needs to make water because you're not drinking it, it grabs the hydrogens from fat and attaches it to oxygen and that it makes its own water. Whoa. I know. So he was like, 
Now, this guy's been in and out of ketosis since, uh, I think since December, maybe even earlier. He knows his stuff. He's down 30 pounds. He's, you know, doing fantastic. And, th and this, like, took it just one more step higher, just the, doing the water. And so then he stopped the water. You know, he, he started drinking water again. And he did his normal water only fast for another two, three days. Then he came out of his 10 day fast. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, whoa. Yeah. Like this is new to me and there's people online. I've, I've then researched it. People on YouTube and stuff. They talk about it. There's a woman who did a six day water only or a six day dry fast. It's like, wait, wait, what? How did you did? You, I don't, I don't know. Like, is it true? Can you actually, I don't think that's even a I true thing. I you died so, after like three days of no water. I know. So, I know. So be very, very, very skeptical about what you, you know, read and, and, and see on YouTube and online and stuff. But this guy, he was very conscientious about doing a, a dry fast in the middle of his regular fast. And he paid attention. Like, you know, every couple hours he's thinking to himself, do I want to drink water? No, I'm good. I'll, I'll just, I won't drink water. And then at midnight one day, he's like, do I need to drink water? Yes, I feel weird. I'm going to drink water. So there's that. Yeah, you definitely want to be very on top of listening to your body at that point. Because the one you know concern about fasting be, beyond three days is the, the potential of fainting. Um, you know, that's uh, like totally blacking out. Um, right. Well, that's, that's from that's if your blood sugar is going down. But the ketones are not going up, mm -hmm. right? So that'd be like hypoglycemia. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, people when they do, let's say a five day fast, um, on day by the end of day two or the end of day three, that's when their body starts making the ketones, and the ketones are going up. But for the first day or two days, they start to feel tired, they feel grumpy, they got hypoglycemia. So then the body says, all right, we're not burning sugar anymore because there's none left. We've got to start burning ketones. So, yeah, there's that. But, okay, so then on day three, they're deep in ketosis. On day four, they got autophagy. Day five, day five they get a new surge of stem cells. And that's, that's how a five-day fast goes. I love it. I just love that idea that you're helping the body clean out all the garbage, the autophagy, the eating up and getting rid of the pathological tissue as you put it and then on day five it's like this gift like you've earned this reward of all this surge of stem cells so now your body is is regenerating itself after taking out all the garbage and um you know no wonder you you know had knee pain and now you don't like people are clearing out the garbage and then the body's inserting all the stem cells to grow new tissue Right. We, we can grow new cartilage, you know, we can grow right. healthy, healthier tendons and ligaments and bones. And, you know, if, if someone has had a, that, that old injury from the sports they played in college or in high school, uh, and they're in their forties or fifties and they still have that injury, they don't have, like, I know their physician may have told them that's just the way it is, or their surgeon may have said, you're just going to live with this for the rest of your life, but it's not true. Our body can right. heal. And it's sort of, this is like the switchboard to turn. It's like, okay, right. let's turn on healing. Um, if someone wanted to do a, go into a fast for the first time, so they don't want to mess with the necessarily ketogenic diet, but like, okay, I'm going to definitely use a fast. Could they um, prime the pump by eating more fat for a few days, like healthy fats, obviously, oh, yeah. before going into a full on water only fast? Could they like prime the pump by, increasing the 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 fats so would that sort of help them to go into ketosis faster um yeah uh, when they go into the water only fast yeah definitely so eat a lot of fat for a couple of days and then start to fast and the other thing you can do is um mod you know during a, a fast if you're just dying for something you can just modify it by consuming some oils um and the other aspect to this is just starting by uh, intermittent fasting. So just skip breakfast. So you have dinner at six and then your next meal is at noon the next day. So that's 18 hours. Then you could do a 24 hour fast and it, which is like dinner to dinner. And then you go for a two day fast and then a three day fast and you'll see it gets easier and easier. 
So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I did a almost three-day fast um, the end of February. And I, I, my body told me, like, I, I actually had noticed, like, by halfway through day two, I wasn't even hungry. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. Like, the first day was kind of a little miserable, but I'm like, whatever, I'll get through it. And it was, it is not, and I love food. It is not anywhere nearly as bad as I thought it would be. And then, um, yeah, ha- like, by the, the second half of the, of the fast was totally fine. And I could have kept going. But I walked into the kitchen. It was just sort of after, it was like maybe around six or seven, and a voice inside my head yelled, "Break the fast!" And I thought that is not the little whiny voice that has been saying, <laughs> "I'm hungry," and so I'm like, "Okay, I'm that is my like my intuition or my gut. I'm gonna listen to it." And I had a meal, and even though I could have kept going, I had a meal, and then and then about an hour later. My son, we had to take him to the hospital because he broke his arm. Oh, wow. And I would not have been with it, like, oh. had the strength. Because then we had to stay up late with him in the children's hospital. And I just wouldn't have had the, the energy or the mental wherewithal during a water-only fast to handle that. And so, like, my yeah. intuition was like, okay, now is the time to break the fast. And it's, it was cool. that. So you got to, like, listen. Your body will, will – or your, you know – your spirit, your body will, will talk to you. Um, I thought that was, that was really neat. Uh, yeah. what about exogenous ketones? I know there's a network marketing company called prove it. That is, um, basically all they sell are exogenous ketones. And they claim that you, it, you, you don't have to, don't worry about this diet. Don't worry about, you know, this weird measuring all everything, just drink our ketones and it puts you in ketosis and you'll gain all the benefits of the ketogenic diet without having to do any dieting. It's sort of like, you know, we, we, we all love the magic pill, right? Oh, just to, don't worry. You don't have to actually go and take a vacation and rest your body and let it heal. Just take this, you know, take this penicillin and you'll be fine. Um, what do you think about exogenous ketones and and should we incorporate them or, you know, do they actually force the body into ketosis or are you just getting keto like readings from your monitor because you're, 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 uh, are you drinking actual ketones or is it causing the body to go into ketosis? ketosis? Yeah, it's uh, typically uh, beta hydroxybutyrate. So it's one of the three ketone bodies that exist. And um, so the bottom line is this. <clears throat> when you do ketosis naturally, whether it's from fasting or eating differently, um, your insulin comes down along with a lot of other things. So other hormones go down and inflammation goes down, and that's the natural process. So if your insulin is high and your sugar is high, et cetera, then you eat some beta-hydroxybutyrate. That's a situation now that has never, ever occurred in the history of man of humankind it's, it's it's not natural right so now there's studies that show that ketosis is bad and feeds cancer and other studies show that ketosis is good and it kills cancer but when you look at the difference the studies that show that ketosis is bad and it feeds cancer they used exogenous ketones oh. so that makes all the difference in the world wow I know. So yeah, I'm not a fan of using um, exogenous ketones. Now, let's say you're in ketosis and everything's going really well. And then you take some exogenous ketones. Does it cause any harm? I don't know. You may get extra benefit. Like if you're running a triathlon or doing something like that, you know, maybe temporarily it's okay. Uh, But don't, you know, I don't know. I'm not going to, I don't really want to answer that. And again, I used to sell beta hydroxybutyrate in a diff, from a different company. And when I learned this, I'm like, okay, I stopped, I stopped selling it because I don't want to involve myself in that. Mm. I love how ethical you are. Oh, thanks. <laughs> and that you're just, you're about, you're about the results. You know, you're right. like, let's just, let's just stick with the science. Um, one thing that happens to some people who switch very quickly into this low carb diet is they get constipation what do you oh, yeah. recommend people do because obviously if they're getting if they have constipation there's a few things like there might be minerally deficient like not enough magnesium they might be dehydrated 
um, cause they're used to getting most of their water from their food. And, um, and so now they've got to really got to up their, their intake of water. Maybe they're not getting yeah. enough fiber cause they're actually not eating enough, uh, vegetables. You're supposed to eat a lot of vegetables in this diet, um, compared right. to what they're normally do. So, uh, a- anything beyond what I just mentioned and, and, and what would you say to combat, um, constipation from either, uh, uh, ketogenic diet or do people get constipated when they fast? Well, I haven't had anybody complain about constipation from fasting. Um, but when it comes to constipation from eating a more ketogenic diet, I've seen over and over again, it's, uh, the microbiome Mm -hmm. and a probiotic would be the solution for that. But in my career, I think that 98% of probiotics don't work. So I had an experience where I lived in a moldy house for eight years and that particular mold settled in my intestines and caused Mm -hmm. constipation. So I literally tried and tested probably just over a hundred different products. And there was one that worked out of all of them. So I stayed on that for three years. And in the meantime, I cleaned up my house as best I could. I got professionals in there, got a new basement, et cetera. And then I moved out, got a new house. Then I did killers. So I did oregano in different forms from different companies, high doses for six weeks. Then I went back on probiotics. So these are the kinds of things I do with patients um, when they experience this, you know, you know, I, most constipation is just simply the microbiome is dysbiotic. There's dysbiosis going mm. on in there and you gotta, you gotta work the supplements, right? And then people will get benefit potentially from, you know, fermented food, kimchi and, and that kind of stuff. But mm-hmm. I've also seen that cause harm too. So this is where a really good doctor comes into play to, um, and to, you know, work the products right and, see, you know, see if, you know, because not everything works for everybody. So what kind of harm did you see happen when someone was eating fermented foods? Was it that they hadn't hand they hadn't handled the o- overgrowth of the bad bacteria right. before yeah. adding the fermented foods or did the fermented foods themselves harm them? The fermented foods themselves were were harming them, were causing more dysbiosis. And that that includes me. What was the what's the fermented drink? Uh, kombucha. I fermented that in my kitchen for over a year, and at some point I realized maybe it was helping me at the beginning, but towards the end it didn't. So I just threw it in the yard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The I variety. felt like I was, what's that? The variety is really important to not stick Definitely. with one yeah. fermented food for a long period of time, but to cycle through different ones. Yeah. That's right. right because but the product that I. Oh, Go sorry. Ahead. I was just going to say, if you were drinking the same kombucha for a whole year, were you not then consuming the same strains of probiotic? Therefore, kind of that is that what threw it off balance because you were just like, I don't know how many strains of bacteria were in your kombucha. But if you like, let's say with the 10 of them, if you only had the same 10 over and over and over again, we're supposed to have like 2000 in our gut. Is that is that what yeah. caused the dysbiosis further by just drinking the same kombucha for a whole year? I I really don't know. I don't really want to try to guess on that one. Oh, okay. But yeah. But you know, the one supplement that helped me, um, it didn't even have a wide variety of organisms. And it wasn't even a very large quantity because there's some that are like 100 billion units. The one that I had was only like 4 billion units. And the deal, the, what makes it so special is that um, it had these, organisms that could then form or change into other organisms. So it's kind of like putting down um, stem cells. Yeah. Well, yeah. Stem cells. I'm trying to do like a garden analogy. Oh, <laughs> like you, you have really good compost that feeds what's already in there. It's not a pre, it wasn't even a prebiotic. I don't know how to. Oh, I know what you're yeah. talking about. It's kind of, it's kind of like a bunch of caterpillars. And then they form into, you know, you got 10 caterpillars and they form into 100 different butterflies. You know, like that's a weird analogy, but that's what it is. And um, and it, can I can I say the name of it? I'm not plugging. No, the... of course. I, I think you're talking about spores, right? No, there's still there's still um, probiotics. Oh, OK. But the name of the company, well, it's standard process. And the uh-huh. name of the product is called ProSynbiotic. I've heard of that one. Yeah, I'm such a huge fan of that. And I've seen that work not just on me, but 
hundreds of patients. You know, I, I moved out of that, that house like it must have been three, so four or five, seven years ago is when I started taking ProSymbiotic. It had just come out just, you know, eight years ago. Now, just to clarify, though, someone has, has um, if they if they suspect they have fungal overgrowth, bacterial overgrowth, uh, candida, like if they have, if they suspect that there's something going on, like a bug, something that they shouldn't just start taking probiotics. They should kill it, kill whatever is in there first, change their diet to kill it, take some supplements to kill it, like oregano, for example, and then follow up with probiotics. Or can they start taking the probiotics uh, and the fermented foods at the same time as killing the uh, small bacterial, small, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, for example? Right. They could do either. So sometimes I'll have people take uh, the killers before bed and then the probiotic in the morning. Or I'll have them do killers four days in a row and then the probiotic three days. Mm -hmm. And then other people, I have them kill <clears throat> every day for six weeks and then we stop that and then we put in probiotics. So I just, I just change it up for what the person needs. And is this something that someone could do in ketosis or in a during a fast or or would that would the handling the stress of die off be too much that's a good question um well die off can be prevented by taking various products They're, the term is drainage products like they mm -hmm. drain out the dead organisms my favorite is actually spanish black radish from standard process you're going to find equivalents on amazon but basically think of a radish or other types of root vegetables that are sulfury. They're not super sweet. They feed the liver lots of sulfur and other nutrients that you know promote detoxification. Plus the fact that it's a root, it soaks up mucus, it soaks up water. So it cleans that way. So yeah, that's how you prevent die-off. If somebody in my office, if a patient is experiencing die-off and they're, you know, miserable, I failed. You know, I, I'm preventing die-off like all the time by you know, adding something similar to Spanish black radish or sometimes charcoal will do it. Bentonite clay could potentially be a drainage product. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, but, but you can, and you can do some killing during a fast, but you know, p p part of ketosis and fasting is, and, and keto adaptation is that you're killing bad bugs anyways, because sick uh, detrimental bugs in your body cannot keto adapt. They can't go from burning sugar to fat back and forth. So they start to die off. Whereas your cells, your body cells, your healthy, you know, organisms, they love it and they get stronger with it. And then same thing with oregano or ginger, other, you know, garlic, bad cells hate that, but good healthy cells love it. So yeah, theoretically you could do this sort of cleansing and probiotic during ketosis and during fasting. And again, I have people doing, you know, no supplements during their fast or that, you know, I have them take supplements during the fast. I just cater it to what their body needs. Got it. I definitely see an advantage to working with you over just trying to figure this out on our own, um, you know, because we just don't know. We don't know what's going on. Um, we And it's always good to have an expert. And I just love your deep understanding of how the body works and how you can adjust someone's diet to support their healing. Keeping in mind the, 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 the big picture, the big picture is you're, you're helping someone to come back into balance and to heal. And so if they temporarily need to eat a different way, that may seem a little difficult, but it's just, it's a, it's a, it's, if they, if they were getting a car accident, God forbid, and they injured themselves and they needed to relearn how to walk or, or they needed to go to physical therapy and have a plan. They know that in six months they're going to be walking again. They just had to, you know, they have to re rehabilitate. Right. And that right. sort of that same amount of mentality. It's like, I, I need to I need to take my body to physical therapy. And this physical therapy is this diet or this fasting. And through this method, I'm going to rehabilitate and, and, and help, help my body to heal um, on a cellular level. So it's sort of like, you know, physical therapy for on a cellular level and, and using, and it might seem odd, like just standing there in the kitchen with a spoon and in one hand and, um, the macadamia 
you know, nut butter in the other or <laughs> or the <laughs> coconut <laughs> coconut oil in one hand and the the spoon in the other and going okay well my lunch is <laughs> this sp spoonful of you know chia seed pudding or whatever um just may may seem totally odd but you know all, it, what's totally odd is going to a physical therapist and doing these weird exercises uh, but the, right. the end result is miraculous, right? So we're just we're just we're supporting the body's ability to heal itself and looking at at how the body heals anyway. And if, if someone doesn't want to do the ketogenic diet, they can do fasting. Uh, but it sounds like maybe you could just talk a bit about this. Like, what is there an advantage over one over the other? Like fasting, water only fasting versus ketogenic. Um, is there, is there like, do you believe in ketogenic diet more than fasting? Or is it kind of like, these are my tools and you get to choose like the, the, the person could choose between the diet and the fasting. Yeah. The, <clears throat> they're tools and the advantage of the ketogenic diet over fasting is duration. So I had a woman who she was in ketosis straight for six months and then she came to see me. Now, she had cancer, ovarian cancer, that spread to her brain, mm. and it fixed it. Wait and, a second. Uh, Did it fix it before she came to you? Uh, yeah. She was concerned. Once she came into my office, she's like, I have an MRI scheduled for, like, you know, a month from now, and, I'm, I'm, and I think that it's solved, right? Because she had an earlier one, and she's like, if this next one is clear— then that means that the diet fixed my cancer, and it did. So the point is, and I, and then, then I taught her about coming out of ketosis. Okay, so anyways, the point is, you can't fast for, she was small, you know, she can't fast for six months. Right. So that's the biggest advantage is duration. Got it. And then also, do you find that another advantage would be that it is therapeutic for the body to have high levels of healthy fat um, kind of in bursts because you're not, like you said, you want them to come in and out of ketosis, but they're clearly now overall over the span of a year getting much more fat in their diet. Yeah. Um, is that healing as well? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. So I just did a video on this too about uh, cholesterol going up in ketosis so here's the, you got to do this equation. You take the total cholesterol minus HDL minus LDL, and you're left with VLDL, also known as remnant cholesterol. That VLDL has to be less than 19. And this is figured out, um, and, and it's on YouTube. There's a guy named Dave Feldman, and he talked about this in a video he did. And it's great information. So I started looking at my patients that way. This is in the last, you know, four weeks. And I'm looking at people who are in ketosis and their LDL goes up and their total cholesterol is now high, considered high. But yet their VLDL is now normal and they're losing. This one guy lost 60 pounds. Another guy reverses diabetes. Another guy uh, has a spring in his step and his energy is great. So these three different patients have these fantastic results and you can't freak out because their LDL is now, you know, too high when the truth is they've saturated their body with all this healthy fat. And yet the most important factor when it comes to cholesterol is VLDL needs to be below 19. If it's above 19, it doesn't matter what your LDL is. You can have low LDL. doesn't matter because VLDL is the most important thing when it comes to those numbers. Can you explain what VLDL is? And is it, is it a, a marker of, 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 uh, predicting damage or does it cause damage? Well, it's, it's a marker of predicting damage. So first of all, let me just explain. We're talking about very low, high, low, you know, these, what is we're talking about density of proteins so people get their blood drawn and they put this blood into a test tube and they spin it down in a centrifuge and some of these particles they this the particles separate some of them are, are very dense and some of them are not very dense okay that's why they, that's how they you know differentiate it. it's just density and so when when somebody goes into ketosis their body is using triglycerides. That's the fuel. 
tri means three, glycerin is sugar. It's okay, so it's the LDL is the bus that carries the sugar, carries the triglycerides out into the muscles to be used as fuel. And then the um, LDL then be once it dumps that triglyceride, it gets converted into being a VLDL. This is what Dave Feldman says. And I'm, I hope I got this right. He actually, you know, I've been going back on Twitter a little bit. <laughs> so then the body's got to use the VLDL and uh, convert it back into a usable bus to carry, you know, the uh, triglycerides again. So you got marathon runners who have normal triglycerides and very, very high LDL, very, very, very high HDL. Because they're marathon runners, they got to use that energy. They're in ketosis. Mm -hmm. And yet their VLDL is still below 19. That's all that, all that matters. And that means that your body, your fats, your metabolism are functioning very, very well. That's what that means. So Dave Feldman was talking about he's had a lot of people send his, their blood work to him. And um, only a very, very small percentage have um, bad VLDLs, like it's too high. A very only a very small percentage. Very interesting. Um, it, that's really exciting to see. Uh, I know it's just there's so much mm, there's so much medical myth around cholesterol and I know. what it actually does, and you know people are put on left, right, and center still put on statins, which just freaks me right. out. And yet.